you're watching Ramping Up Your English, a way for intermediate level English learners to improve English skills. We take a content-based approach to improving English proficiency for those who are no longer at those beginning stages beginning to learn English. This is segment two of episode 63. Let's review the elements we want in a report you're writing on your chosen animal. Now, we've already covered these elements in previous episodes. Describing your animal, showing its classification, explaining where the animal is found, its range and distribution, describing the habitat it needs, and the biomes where this habitat can be found. Now, we just did multiple episodes on life cycle. Today's episode will explore the diet of an animal. Now, we featured diet in our previous episode on African animals, but we have more to learn. We also want to include the subject's physical and behavior adaptations as well as its conservation status. So when we talk about an animal's diet, we want to include what the animal eats. However, we want to go beyond that information to where the animal stands in the tropic world. In other words, the role it has in the food chain and in a similar concept called food webs. We want to learn how the animal gets its food and what it does with its food once it gets it. So that's what we're gonna explore in this episode. The concept of food chain has been around a long time. In English, the word chain means a linear structure that consists of links, usually oval in shape, that connect one to another link. You may have seen a small chain worn as jewelry, like a gold or silver chain, and if any link breaks in that chain, it no longer stays around the neck. Now, a food chain works the same way. Each link must be connected in order for the chain to work. The fundamental source of life energy in a traditional food chain is solar energy, which is produced by the sun. Without this solar energy, there is no chance of life energy being passed around for things that live. Well, there is an exception that's been discovered during my generation, but that can be considered a small exception when speaking of life on Earth. So how do living things like you and me get energy from the sun? Well, we could lie out in the sunshine all day and still not get a single calorie of life energy. That's because we're not in the right place on the food chain. In order for solar energy to get captured for use by animals, we need something that can absorb that solar energy and turn it into life energy. Fortunately for us, we share this planet with plants. They can do what we're incapable of doing. They take in energy from the sunlight, turn it into energy that can be passed on to other living things. For this reason, plants are called producers. Now, with every breath we take, we should be grateful for air, but we should also be grateful for producers. Without them, we could not receive the energy we need to live. And neither could all those animals we admire so much. So the next time you see a plant, thank it for your life. Now, like many animals on Earth, we can get the energy we need to live by eating plants. People don't need to eat meat from other animals at all. When you think of deer, elk, mountain goats, and many other animals, they have the same needs as we have. They can get their life energy from plants, so they're called consumers. They consume the life forms that collect the solar energy and convert it to life energy we need. Yet there are some animals that can't live on the energy produced by plants. The cheetah is a good example. It needs to eat another consumer to get its life energy that way. And most farm animals are consumers, getting their energy directly from plants. They are called primary consumers. They don't eat animals. They can't. Their bodies are designed to eat plants, and that's all they can eat. The mouse that eats the nuts you leave out is a primary consumer. Same for the moose that eats the plants in the streams. For primary consumers, the food chain is fairly short. But what about the cheetah and others that must get their life energy by eating other consumers? They have a place in the food chain as well. They're called secondary consumers. They eat primary consumers. It's not a choice for secondary consumers. They could no more live by eating plants than we could live by lying out in the sunshine. 
Now, so the secondary consumers have a longer food chain than the primary consumers or the producers. Now, what about animals that eat the animals that eat the primary consumers? Any idea what they're called? The answer is tertiary consumers. Their food chain is even longer. As we'll see, tertiary consumers are often found in an ocean environment. Now, remember that life energy, the nutrition, comes from the food chain to the ultimate consumer. Now, this animal would be described as at the top of the food chain. And since an animal would need to be a predator to be at the top of the food chain, it would also be described as an apex predator. Now, these names can help you report on the diet of your chosen subject, but there are some names to know as well. Now, remember the primary consumers, those that eat only plants? That animal that eats plants and their products, like seeds, leaves, and nectar, are called herbivores. If my report were on a deer or a moose, I would note that it's an herbivore. Now, you may be familiar with the word herb, a food derived from plants, and that can help you remember herbivore. What about those secondary and tertiary consumers, those animals that must get their life energy from eating other animals? Well, we have a word for those as well. They're called carnivores, which means meat eaters. Cheetahs, lions, and wolves all are carnivores. What about animals like bears and chimpanzees? They have a diet consisting of plants and animals. Remember when I said that people can live on plants alone? Well, they can, but most want to eat meat. Animals that can live off plants and animals are called omnivores. They can eat anything and get nutrition from their food. Now, some animals eat only certain other animals. Those are carnivores, yes, but it's that animal that only eats insects is called an insectivore. Those are mostly birds. So there are some words that you can use to report on the diet of the animal you're researching. In fact, you've likely encountered these words in your source material. A certain question comes to mind. How do we know what an animal eats, especially if it's nocturnal or just shy? Well, one way scientists uh, research the diet of an animal is to collect its scat. So this is what scat is. So the scat is a substance that's excreted from the end of the animal's digestive system to jettison the undigested food. It's the animal's poop. Now, this is some scat I collected when hiking in southern Oregon near Ashland. It appears to be the scat of a coyote or perhaps some other carnivore. Now, how can I tell? Look at the fur in this scat as I pull it apart. A well-trained wildlife biologist would see not only the fur that we see in this scat, but would be able to better tell you what animal it is. Now, I am not a biologist, so I can only guess. So I found scat from animals I've never got to see on the trail. Some large scat told me that a bear was on the trail and that it was eating a lot of apples. Weasels leave their scat on a rock in the middle of the trail to announce their presence. Now, there seems to always be some fur or something fishy in their scat. When you collect scat, be sure to secure it in a plastic bag and wash your hands well when you get back home. Now, one of the best sources of learning about food chains is this book. It's called Quien Come Que. That's Spanish for who eats what. Although I don't have an English version of this book, it's well enough illustrated that it can be understood in any language. Now, the cover has a clear illustration of an ocean food chain with a tiny fish eating a plant, a larger fish eating the tiny fish, and a shark eating the larger fish. Inside, a soup, uh, simple chain is illustrated from the leaf of a caterpillar to a wren to a falcon. The wren must eat many caterpillars to get enough nourishment to survive. The falcon must eat many wrens or other birds to survive. Each link in the chain pass the energy to the next consumer. In this case, the falcon is at the top of this food chain. The author reminds readers that most animals form parts of various food chains, eating more than one thing. The food chain seems like a simple thing at first, but in reality, 
many food chains interact with others. In the ocean, food chains get even longer. Here, the barracuda is at the top of the food chain by eating the tertiary consumer. Now, some plants in the ocean are so small they can only be seen when grouped together. These are known as plankton. There also are plankton in the ocean that are tiny animals known as zooplankton. These form the base of many ocean food chains. Now, food chains are a way of tracing the various things that animals eat. They demonstrate the importance of every link in the food chain. Another way of viewing how animals eat uh, depends on their each other in that independent way for their diet is the food web. It's more complex than a food chain. However, it, in its complexity, it illustrates the reality of animal and plant communities. Now, notice how the food web demonstration has to do with the interdependence of life in the ocean. Also notice how the whole web reaches back to the tiny plants and animals that pass on nutrients to make their way all the way to the animals there. Those tiny plants are producers just like their counterparts on land. They capture energy from the sun and pass it on to the animals. These tiny plants are called phytoplankton. The tiny animals that feed on them are called zooplankton. Let's learn more about these tiny drifters.